Hello and welcome to the Eastman's Predator Pros podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Nimnick, and we are back for another episode. Hard to believe 55 of these episodes in the books. I uh, never really thought uh, <laughs> I'd have 55 different things to talk about when it comes to, to coyote hunting way back when I started this, but here we are. So um, once again, want to appreciate. I really appreciate you guys listening to this podcast. Um, you know, your feedback, everything that you guys uh, do, your ratings and things like that is what made this the number one or has made this the number one predator hunting podcast out there. So uh, greatly appreciate that. But on this episode, um, got some friends of mine. Chris Linder, Eric Scott. Um, I was actually in North Dakota with those guys here a couple weeks ago. We were filming for upcoming episodes of The Last Stand. Um, so figured it'd be fun to get them on, talk about our hunt a little bit, recap uh, how pretty much how the weather just destroyed us. <laughs> it, was, it was a struggle. Um, you know, we killed some coyotes, but, uh, you know, the weather really did play a role in that, you know. So talk about that, uh, kind of some difference in tactics and things like that, um, just in styles that you see with different coyote hunters in different parts of the country. Um, and then kind of get uh, a little bit of their background, how they both kind of got into coyote hunting, got their start, things like that. So should be a good one. But before we jump into this, need to thank the sponsors of this episode, which are Onyx Hunt and Swagger Bipods. Now, maybe you're looking for a Christmas present. Um, if you're like me, your wife is probably has a hard time buying stuff for you because if you're like me, I just go out and buy it if I need it. So yeah, my Christmas list is usually pretty short just because I have it already. <laughs> but Onyx is one of those things that you can say, Hey hun, Hey, my Onyx subscription is coming up. Um, why don't you hook me up with uh, a new subscription for next year? Um, you know, I think it's a hundred bucks. You can get the whole United States, every state. Um, who knows? Maybe it'll motivate you to go on a, a coyote hunting trip somewhere. If you have access to all the landowner information, and everything else in, in every state, um, but, uh, but yeah, huge tool, obviously, you know, keeping track of all your properties, all your stands. I've talked about that a lot. You know, it's an ongoing effort. You know, you can never have enough access, um, when it comes to hunting coyotes. So being able to keep track of all those spots, especially if you're in a part of the country where you're dealing with small chunks of land, you know, a little chunk here, a little chunk there, and you have to line up tons and tons of places and dealing with lots and lots of multiple landowners, a, you know, huge tool to be able to store all that, pull that up, look, see what you got going on. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you have it on your your phone. Uh, easiest way to do it is just download the, the Onyx Hunt app on your phone. It'll walk you through everything, get your membership set up, um, and then you have access. Then obviously, then you can pair it into a tablet in your vehicle. Um, so if you're going down the road, you can pull it up on that. You might even be able to pull it into your navigation system on your vehicle, the screen that comes on your dashboard and uh, and do it there so you can track your routes and see where you're going from stand to stand. So yeah, pull up that Onyx Hunt app uh, on your phone and you can get started on that. Now with Swagger, once again, maybe you're looking for a Christmas present. Here you go. Hey, maybe you need a new set of those 142s. Maybe you want to try a pair of those QD42s like Rick likes to run um, when we're filming for the last stand. Um, either way, you know, give them a shot. I don't think you'll be disappointed. You know, on this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about shooting positions, shooting out of the prone versus shooting from the sitting position and, and getting familiar with that and being able to shoot efficiently from the sitting is, is really important. Um, you know, and having a system like a swagger bipod that not, not only gives you the stability, um, but it gives you the mobility as well, because if you've hunted coyotes long enough, you'll know that they don't always show up right where we think they're, they're going to show up from. We have to move and make quick adjustments, get on coyotes and make quick shots, you know? So, having uh, something that you're able to do that, you know, move quickly, get on coyotes and that you feel comfortable shooting off of is huge. So, um, so yeah, jump on there, swaggerbipods.com. You can use my promo code, which is coyote craze 25. Um, and that'll give you uh 25% off uh, one item, I believe. So, uh, you're welcome for that. Hope you love it. But uh, like I said, you want to take advantage of that. You can go over to swaggerbipods.com. Well, Eric and Chris, welcome to the podcast, fellas. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I feel like we just got done talking, you know. I mean, after riding around in the truck with you guys for about three days, you know. Well, really, I guess I didn't really get to ride around in the truck with you guys on our hunt. But, you know, after hunting with you guys and sitting around drinking beer and, 
eating and stuff like that. I, I feel like uh, we've already recorded a couple podcasts last week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bring a toe oh, strap. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a shovel. <laughs> <sighs> no, it was a great hunt. Yeah. You know, if you guys, uh, if you guys are listening to this, you know, coming up in uh, in January on the last stand, we uh, I just was up in North Dakota last week hunting with with Chris and Eric, and we'll get into that hunt a little bit, you know, coming up. But uh, no, it was fun. It was my first time ever hunting in North Dakota. Um, you know, they were nice enough to let me shoot my first North Dakota coyote ever. You know, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I didn't Perfect. even have to hog them all. Uh-uh. There was no dog hogging in this trip. <laughs> Chris, you look like on the camera that you're still struggling with your audio. Or is that your hearing aid, like Eric asked? Yeah, that's these earbuds. I don't know. The okay. Keep falling out. I don't know if I'm putting, probably put them in the wrong ear or something. I don't know. I lost. Well, I don't know. It's like, yeah, that's just great. Well, <laughs> some, of, some of our older fellows that listen to this podcast, podcast can probably relate to your struggles. It's probably. Uh, I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> maybe they maybe they got some gears I can borrow. <laughs> Be better than these better than these things here. I'm trying to I don't know if they got which ear they're supposed to go in. I don't know. So on on the subject of earbuds and earpieces, um, when Chris and I ran we ran walkie talkies last year. We were just gonna try it, you know, because a lot of the spots we hunt, we can't split up in terms of like drop sets. You know, you drop yeah. a guy off on one corner, just unfortunately it's gridlocked it's a lot of mile by mile sections and and by like the third stand i mean i got my earpiece in clipped to my bino harness and i'm talking to him and it would take a couple minutes for chris to call me back and i'm like chris you see this coyote you know coming in and 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 then all of a sudden i look at him in my binos and he's laying on his belly talking into the walkie talkie like this and he's like i can't keep that damn earpiece in my ear so every time he does it i think i have to like ring him first like press the fucking call button first and and get him to see it and then be like oh yeah what's up you know (laughs) yeah yeah i I love technology you know yeah I was almost going to call my kids downstairs. I'm, I'm I'm in Wisconsin right now at my uh at my at my daughter's house here, and I was almost going to call my kids down to show me how to work all this stuff, but I'm figuring it out. <laughs> well, we'll get along. We'll get along just fine throughout this thing. If yeah. we all of a sudden see you over in your video screen doing something, messing with your earpiece, Eric and I will just carry on the conversation yeah, for a while. Just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah. If I lose you, I'll find my way back. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get this going. I always like to introduce you guys a little bit. Um, you know, let, let's start with Eric. G- give me a little bit of your background, Eric, on um, kind of how you got your start in, in into calling coyotes. Um, maybe how, you, you know, where you killed your first coyote. Just give me a little intake on to, onto where you started that journey. So when I was young, my dad, he'd always bring us out to North Dakota. Him and his couple of his buddies had a hunting shack. And then uh, when I was young, you know, four, five, six, he'd be bringing us out spring snow goose hunting. You know, he'd drape us in white sheets and lay us in the spread with them. And I kind of grew up hunting birds, progressed into pheasants. And then, you know, we used to run a couple dogs and then deer became a big part of my life. And then I went to college and I was playing baseball and, and I, I went to a junior college first and then I decided to get my degree. So I got my degree and then it was like, okay, I had a couple of, you know, older offers, it's like maybe we'll try and revisit it well they weren't there anymore unfortunately because i was out so i went and played at U- university of minnesota duluth and just large classrooms wasn't a thing i'll just be honest i needed that intimate you know up front even when it came to calling coyotes i kind of how this all began i needed someone to not tell me over the phone but like you know what what do what do what do you see that i can see so i took an offer out in north dakota went and played baseball out there and i remember one fall um, a buddy of mine, we went out to the shack. My, my dad and his buddies had still had it. We went, it was a blizzard out, absolute blizzard. And I mean, the game warden co- rolled up to us when we, him and I were walking this cattail slough. We were just, we were knee deep in pheasants. We shot our three, three sharp tail apiece, our three Hungarians had our three pheasants. And we were to the point where it's like, well, what are we going to do? So we ended up plowing through massive snow drifts, fresh snow. Fortunately, you weren't going to get buried <laughs> and we were able to stay in the shack that night. And then the next night we're like, okay, in the morning, what are we going to do? Like, we can't kill any more birds. I mean, technically we could, but at that point it's like all for what a picture, you know, kill, kill nine more birds to do what, go back to the dorms and, you know, gut these things up. So it's like, well, let's go try and 
call a coyote. Like I got, you know, I got my 22, 250, always bring it with, it was just mandatory to bring it with, even with my dad, you know, you see a fox or a raccoon or whatever it was, a road dog. Everybody loves a good road dog chase every now and then. So I remember this one tree grove that I had talked to a uh, rancher that let us go chase some birds. And he's like, yeah, I seen a couple coyotes down in there. Well, at the time, I mean, I'm 20, I'm 20 at the time. So I didn't, didn't really know what was going on. I'd watched enough Randy Anderson videos, Les Johnson videos, where it's like the hand call is key, you know? So I start squawking on this hand call. And I mean, within minutes, I was just, it sounded like a, a kid getting beaten bloody murder. You know, I don't know what I was doing, but whatever I did, <laughs> these two coyotes come absolutely guns blazing up the tree grove. We've got one gun. And I wanted my buddy Heath to shoot one too, you know, cause we were going to kind of pass the gun, like go make a set try and call a coyote and they ended up both coming in at the same time one come down my end of the tree grove you know we're 15 yards apart and i'm like heath i got a coyote coming up he's like oh, i got a coyote coming up and i'm like well how far is yours and he's like oh it's still down there like 200 yards and mine's almost there shot mine walked over and by the time i was able to give him the gun to shoot the coyote had figured out what was going on he t- I tailed it <laughs> out of there so f- from that point forward it was just like this is this is something i can do i absolutely love pandemonium I love spot and stock and deer with, with my bow is probably my favorite thing besides killing coyotes now. But there came a time after I left Mayville and went and pursued uh, minor league baseball, I, had, I didn't coyote hunt for – I didn't coyote hunt until 2015 is about when that was. So there was like a six-year dry spell where I didn't even call coyotes. That was – you know, I killed a couple road dogs, killed that one coyote with him, and it's like it was ingrained in my head, like I want to do this. Well – Ended up meeting my wife at the time. We moved out to Denver for work for my job. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth on calling coyotes in that type of country, which was pretty sweet. So I just started knocking on doors. I was new, drove around with Minnesota plates. I thought you were talking about those urban coyotes in the the city. No, (laughs) those, those are, those are like clockwork. Now you're talking about the Pawnee grasslands. Anybody listen to this probably that, you know, exactly where I'm talking about. Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so we lived in Parker. So from Parker, I would go just straight, straight east. Okay, yeah, yeah. Straight east. And I'd make a loop up near the airport, and I'd come down around there, knock on a couple doors, and there were just a couple couple ranchers that were like, yeah, deer hunting's over, you know, go ahead. Well, I cut my teeth, and I actually was able to call in coyotes. I didn't really figure out a system. I didn't figure out patterns. I just was really good at, at scouting. A, I was always looking for giant deer because I didn't know at the time how hard it was to draw that tag for <laughs> even a oh, resident, yeah. even, you know, so it was like, I'd see a giant mule deer and then I'd look and I'd see coyotes not far from the mule deer or the whitetail herds, you know, at the time when I was hunting them in the, in the snow, when they did have snow. So then it was like, okay, these coyotes are following deer. I always, always seen them around cattle. It's nothing new to anybody now, but those were the types of things that I started to put together And then her and I ended up moving back and that's really when it got going. And for me living in Minnesota, I don't get to hunt as much as I want. It might look like it, but, you know, (laughs) guiding with Terry out at the ranch, the birds take up a lot of time. So really once November hits, it's solid deer for my wife, myself, my dad, and my daughter now that she's turning 12 next year. So that's kind of going to be on my thinking. So any chance I could get in a coyote tournament, I was going to jump right into a coyote tournament. I love competition, whether I get spanked or not. To me, it doesn't matter. I just love it. Now it's starting to matter because I'm starting to delegate what I enjoy the most and and coyote hunting might start to surpass archery deer here pretty soon, you know, on foot. Like I said, I love, I love the chase on foot, but this whole coyote thing, the way it's evolved over the last three or four years, absolutely fallen in love with it just the when you piece it together you know and like I said I get to hunt 10 to 15 days a year maybe that's that's the the dead honest truth and I'd say about 12 of them are with Chris and the other would be with Terry down at the lodge you know so we try and jump into tournaments we might fun hunt every now and then but for the most part it's you know we're really putting together pins on our map now where it's like okay we've killed coyotes here we can go back and kill these coyotes and that's kind of how it got started for me you know nice back to that first coyote i have a question about that story so so i'm picturing this setup in my head so obviously you didn't know what you're doing at the time no idea except so you like how wide i'm picturing you hiding on one side of the tree row and your buddies on the other but he doesn't even have a gun with him had no gun had shotgun actually had a shotgun 
And but you're like what? Like was it a single tree grove wide or like, like about, multiple? I'd say about like the tree grove you killed your first coyote in in North Dakota. It was you know ten yards wide maybe. But enough where you that, could hear that. him talk to each other. Oh, Hunter, we could yeah, talk straight yeah. through wind in our face. I knew <laughs> at the time it's like I gotta get the wind in my face. Like if I'm hunting like a, this, like I would hunt deer, I either gotta get a crosswind or get this wind in my face. So then you jumped up and went crashing through the tree row to hand him your gun so oh, yeah. you could maybe you thought the coyote 100%. might be stupid enough to stand there. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, you've come a long way, Eric. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, now, Chris, yeah. I'm, I'm, I bet you, Chris has probably got even a better story than that, I bet, for his first coyote, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I still I hear a new story every time. Oh, it's a new one every time. It. Well, what, oh, what's the story no, of the not, week this time, Chris? Come on. <laughs> not of his well, first coyote, just of all his trapping and his chasing him with his dogs. I love yeah. it when I sit in the truck. It's like, dude, tell me another <laughs> one. What did you used to do? My my very first coyote that I ever shot. Um, actually, I, now if you want to go to my first coyote I shot that I actually called in, or my first coyote that I shot, because the very first coyote that I shot was actually in a trap. Um, I did do some trapping. My dad taught me to trap and stuff, and that would have been in 1985. So we're getting back there a little ways. I'm kind of damn. You are dating yourself now. Damn. <laughs> Dude, I was in my mom's womb at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but that that coyote, I actually had set a trap on a on a, on a logging road, and uh, and I, I I made a dirt hole with a trap on each side of it, and uh, and that and this. Uh, this coyote managed to get one foot in each trap, and there he sat with both his both his feet crossed. And I walked up to that coyote man. I was that's the first time I've been up close and personal with a coyote. I mean, ever. And and you know, and I, all I had was my twelve gauge shotgun, uh, an old shotgun that's actually hanging on my wall at home now on a on a pretty cool duck mount. But um, I had that twelve gauge shotgun that my mom had bought for me, and and so I walked up about five feet from that shotgun, and I shot him right square in the face. Um, <laughs> that was my first. <laughs> You know, so that did wonders for the for the pelt, as you can imagine. You know, yeah. I mean, that you know, tur turned my at that, and it was probably about a a ten dollar coyote anyway. But I turned it into about a three dollar coyote. Um, what state anyhow, was that in? Uh, that, that would have been in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, uh, all right. I was in Wisconsin where I grew up, and then uh, and then I, I really kind of started calling coyotes as a as a kid. I had a little uh, you know Burnham Brothers uh, cassette tape um, that I used to put in a little boom box that we had. You know, oh yeah, kids. yeah batteries in it we'd sit out there and play the squealing rabbit and stuff and you know we, we had our little 22s you know we didn't know much i mean occasionally we'd get a fox or something to come right in and we'd get and, and wisconsin's hard calling because it's so thick woods you know i mean it's just really really tough to get in close to a coyote um you know because i would go down windy uh, you know and you can't see more than like 50 yards in most places in the thick woods so it's really tough to, to to really call there but when i moved to montana um I after the after I was in the service, I was in the Navy, and after I got out of the Navy, I went to Montana, and and out there I started calling coyotes a little bit. Um, I actually howled in my first coyote. I bought a Loman howler, one of them old, had the old plastic tube on it, you know, the whole nine yards. And yep. I I remember just trying to I didn't even know what what I should even sound like, you know. And I remember blowing on the thing a couple times, and all of a sudden this coyote come I'm just flying over the hill, and I had a had a little old coast to coast two twenty two that was uh was my grandpa's. I still have it today, and. I remember that coyote come running over the hill and I shot him and, and that like, even though I had done it a little bit previously to that, that was like lit the fire right there for me. You know, I mean, it was like when that coyote used to come charging over the hill at me and I, I don't know, something about that. I mean, my blood got pumping so much and I was like, I was addicted from then on, you know, and I, and I started calling and, and then uh, when I moved to North Dakota, um, we really had some, had some pretty good coyote calling out there and, and, uh, and that's really where I kind of, from there, my you know my passion grew. I mean, I think I've bought just about every predator call on the market. You know, <laughs> that's ever been out there from hand calls to electronics. You know, I've I've had most all of them, and and I don't know. I still get just about as excited as I did when that very first coyote came running. And you know, when you see one coming, it's just you know I, I think some of us in the air, it's not you know. And if it doesn't excite you, then you know I, why do it? But I I still get excited every time I see a coyote come running in. That's, it never gets old. I think hundred percent. I think that's. You talk to anybody that's got the bug like we all do for coyotes, that's exactly it, right? Like the if you've seen a thousand of them or ten of them come running to the call, it still gets you the same way. No. You know? Never gets old. Absolutely. Yep. So, you know, to me, you know, some of the some of the best friends I have 
now, you know, I've met through coyote hunting. Um, you know, to me, it's always about the camaraderie, right? Like the people you meet, you know, I love hunting with people, you know, coyote hunting is one of those things to a lot of people that it's like, Oh my God, we can only do this with one or two guys, right? We can't have all these guys. Well, as you saw, when we came up and filmed, you know, we had five, five of us hiding on the hillsides, you know, six of us hiding on the hillsides. Um, you know, so you two actually met through coyote hunting, correct? Uh, yeah, we, uh, well, through hunting I mean, essentially but coyote hunting is what kind of brought you together. Brought us together well actually what brought us together is um i didn't know chris at the time when i was going out to where my dad and his couple buddies had their shack you know so in college like i said i was going out there never ran into chris he didn't have the cafe at the time and uh i remember going back out and uh, i was with my my best friend heath and my cousin jake and we were out there snow goose hunting, spring snow goose and uh chris and i had ran into each other once he started the cafe and you know we'd see each other but like i said minnesota plates it's just an ongoing battle that you're never gonna win when a (laughs) non-resident you know when your non-resident comes in you already got a hashtag next to your name and it's like you got to do everything in your power to prove your worth you know it's like i gotta i gotta show this guy like look i'm here to hunt i want to kill shit whether that's ducks geese and chris loved to hunt waterfall so we actually shared the field hunting spring snow goose and I don't know if I told you this, but I found, well, I found the roost. Chris knew where it was because it was only a couple of miles north of his house. And uh, we ran into him and we're like, hey, we found a roost. You know, do you want to go hunt? And I remember to him, him and Han, like, uh, fuck, you know, never shared yeah. a field with this kid before. He's just out of state, young guys. punk and his, and his two buddies. Yeah, I got blue plates. It's like, oh, this kid's trouble right away. And actually, it was probably one of the most memorable hunts with not with my father like we'll put it that way he it we woke up the next morning you couldn't see your hand in front of your face there was so much fog there was no wind so right away he's like yeah i think the decoy spreads we're not going to do it so i'm looking at my cousin and my 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 best friend and i'm like what the fuck is this guy talking about like we mean no no de- we're not gonna put in any deeks he's he grabs his cassette tape or whatever speaker system he had He's got two speakers going out from these cords, and he's got, he starts playing it. We're sitting by these grain bins in the middle of a pick cornfield. I mean, we're 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 using the grain bin as our our blind, and <laughs> it was a it was only a matter of time when it became shooting hours. He turned the collar on, and you could I mean you could hear the roost. They were a mile and a half, maybe Chris, two miles away, maybe as the crow flies. Yeah, I and they just started coming over in waves, and I mean you couldn't see them, but you could hear them. And then finally, when the, the fog would kind of start to break, you'd see just little shooting lanes up. And I mean, there you could throw rocks up and hit them. That's how low they were. And I remember <laughs> at one point, I mean, I just looked and couldn't see, but I could hear. And I just started shooting. I think we all just started shooting. And all of a sudden, just thump, thump, thump. Birds are just dropping. And we're like, oh, this is epic. Well, Chris had an old Chesapeake Bay Retriever that was kind of on his last leg. So it was a fun hunt. We got to share together with him my dog is pretty much you know the last hunt of his life his long, long life he had we piled them up i mean i don't know we shot 70 80 birds with no decoys and an e-collar playing and uh and then from that day forward it's like chris became one of my very good friends because it's like okay we built trust this was fun i can get along with this guy yeah he's a little older than me but he can keep up and he knows what he's doing um when it comes to scouting birds or finding coyotes or finding big deer and it was just we just meshed well you know, and, and then it was like, do you like dunk coyotes? Oh, I love dunk coyotes. It's like, well, I just, I heard these coyotes howling back here. You know, maybe we could go, you know, make a set sometime. And we ended up going to make a set and killing coyotes. And then it was like from that day forward, I don't know, six, five, six years ago, it was just any chance I got that I could come out, I was coming out. And I, I haven't brought my shotgun out here in five years. That's how much coyote hunting's just taken over. I don't even bird hunt much anymore. I haven't shot a pheasant in a while. I haven't shot a duck in a while. And that used to be life you know for me in college and with my dad but like i said once chris and i realized it's like fall for him you know september to i'd say early very early november as he's just gung-ho ducks and geese because he's good at it i don't even come out anymore it's like tell me when you're done and then we can start calling coyotes well then you run into the deer you know so now you got opening a deer hunting and anybody knows north dakota deer hunting it's like you don't even go out like you're you just don't, it's just the orange army's running around everywhere. The coyotes are on the edge. And so we kind of wait till, you know, I'd say, you know, when you guys came up, that's probably the earliest I've ever hunted coyotes with Chris. We usually wait till there's 
deep, <laughs> knee deep snow, which is unfortunate, but you know, we kind of like tell to tell you guys didn't know how to off. react getting into places where we could drive right in there. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I said, dude, I've never seen these spots from the road before. Like this is crazy. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm still airway, thinking of the snow goose story real quick. The snow goose story. How many of these snow geese bounced off these grain bins as they're falling from the sky? Here, I'll <laughs> let you take it, Chris. Yeah, I think we had a couple that bounced off the grain bins. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, they were we had birds piling up everywhere. That was fun. You know, it just it just goes right back to and that's something that I've always been for myself. I have always always um, aspired to do. I love calling stuff, and I don't care if it's a uh, if it's bugling for elk, if it's uh, if it's, you know, rattling and grunting for white-tailed deer, um, calling for ducks and geese, uh, calling coyotes. I just, I don't know. I always just love to call stuff. Um, you know, and that's, it's just something that's been, I don't know, some people like it, some people don't. Some people like to just sit and be quiet or, do, or you know, hunt or stalk or sneak or whatever. To me, I just, there's something different about calling. It's like just letting them know right where you are. And it's, I don't and like with coyotes, you know, it's, it's, it's changing from, you know, you're kind of becoming the prey or, you know, you know, you know, instead of like hiding from them, it's, you know, you're telling them, Hey, here I am, you know, let's go. And, and I, I just, I just love calling. I don't know something about it. I just really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So the first time you guys got together on that first coyote hunt, Eric, were you kind of like, okay, I'm just going to lay low. I'm going to let Chris do his thing. Cause it's always weird, right? When you hunt with somebody for the very first time, who's especially doing the, the coyotes, calling? it's like, yeah. it's like, okay, who, who's going to do the calling? You know, do I want to do this? Whose place are we going to? You know, there's all this logistic stuff that you got to kind of get through, right? Oh, yeah. It's like some of the guys you run into at tournaments, you know, when you're like, oh, do you guys, what do you do? You know, I'm straight past you. What we calling them on it? And you get them guys that'll tuck their tail and they're like, oh, you know, we got a couple sounds. It's like, oh, knock it off. Knock it off. We're just give it a rest. Like it's a coyote. You know, you're either hauling them, you're calling them, you're challenging them, you're whatever, whatever it is, right? You're playing prey distress. But, you know, it was funny because like when we first started to hunt together, it was literally that like, well, who, where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. What, what were you thinking? It's like, who's going to bite first? Like, <laughs> all right, dude, fine. We're going to this spot I got and and then we'll go to yours next or you can call this time and, and then I'll call the next stand. And, you know, once we figured out a pattern, you know, I'd say we were on the same page pretty quickly because, you know now it just depends like i remember one episode you did you get given the remote to rick and you're like i just not calling it said something more about what i'm pressing like i'm gonna give it to rick and then rick's just like well here they're, they're gonna start coming in you know <laughs> so if chris and i go through a spell like that and it's like i drew blank on three stands it's like take the remote i'm going downwind and a lot of times in our tournaments i mean like i said the snow is miserable and when i mean miserable we're snowshoeing in so i think time management is a big thing of what i wish we had on our side when it comes to tournaments in february and late january out here where we aren't because they're these like i said they're mile by mile sections and you have to walk into them everybody calls them off the road here you walk in two three hundred yards get up over the hill call them but chris and i kill more coyotes when we walk in you know so it, once we started to do that it, it just we just became in sync and then it, the trust you just let your guard down it's like i trust this guy you know, and he trusts me and I'll never backdoor somebody ever. Absolutely never. And Chris knows that. Like if I've ever been in a tournament where he wasn't my partner and I was hunting with another buddy or someone from out North Dakota, hey, Chris, you mind if I hit that public spot, it, even a public spot? I'm just never going to do it without asking somebody first. If they say, yeah, you know, I'd rather not. I'd like to save that. And then I'll find another one, you know, and I think once him and I built that trust, it's like, I don't want to hunt with anybody else. Like I love hunting with new people. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but it was just like, you know, we're in sync, you know, and I think that's that's what you need to find when you're, whether you're calling coyotes with a partner in a tournament or you're just doing it for fun, because I don't want to go out and screw up the set, even if it's for fun, like we want to kill a coyote, you know, and, and then make mental notes of what we did right or what we did wrong and fix it for the next one. Well, that's a good point. You know, my oldest boy, he's, he's a junior, so he's old enough to drive. He spent the winter hunting. Well, of course, all of his buddies want to go with him, right? And so after, you know, a month of this going on, I, I had to sit down and say, Creighton, I said, so let me get this right. I said, you're taking your truck hunting all the time. You're going to your spots that you got permission on. And all you're doing is your buddies are just coming along to do what? You know, <laughs> well, dad, I'm like, all right, dude, I got to teach you. I got it. There's got to be a mutual relationship here, right? When you find a good 
little group of dudes that take. you hunt with, everybody understands that, right? That, the, okay, hey, I got to contribute to some way. You know, maybe I don't have the ground, right, today. So I'm paying for the gas, okay? Or whatever it may be, right? I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways you can contribute, you know? But uh, it's funny because it's all stuff that we've all learned over the years, you know, hunting with different guys and getting burned. Mm-hmm. And you're like, damn, I ain't hunting with that guy anymore. Or, you know, <laughs> things like that come up, you know? But yeah. It's it's interesting. It's you know, told me ten years ago that'd be something I had to teach my boy. I'd be like, no, I would never thought of that, you know. But seeing him go through that, I'm like, all right, I know they're your buddies, but you, right. hey, sooner or later you got to say, hey, either you start dishing out for some gas money, and then I said, yeah, then you're pretty much just taking them on a guided hunt, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> right. hey, if they have some stuff, go hunt their stuff. So it's got to be mutual. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, like, you know, like, you know, like when you came out by us, you know, you know, yeah, we, we hunted like the, you know, the first day or two, you know, I mean, we, we hunted, we, you know, I, I had a bunch of ground kind of up north and, 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 and south of town and we went and hunted a lot of my ground. And then the, then the last day, then, then it was like, all right, Eric, Eric was up to bat. We went and hunted his ground, you know, yeah. I and mean, we just, we just shut down and, and we do that even, even like in our tournaments and stuff like that too. It's like, well, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's hunt my ground up here and you got ground over there. And, you know, and we're constantly always, both of us are always you know, looking for new ground, you know, talking to uh, other landowners and stuff and constantly getting new stuff. And, you know, and we, you know, you, everybody contributes a little bit to, uh, you know, to what you got going on. And, and what's well, a huge part, you know, land access is huge. And if you got two guys lining up stuff as opposed to one, right? Like, why not? You know, and, I mean, yeah. and, and yeah. we even do it kind of geographically, even too, you know, I mean, I, you know, there, a lot of our ground has has crossed paths. I've hunted ground that that Eric's hunted, and vice versa, you know, over the years and stuff. But it's kind of like it's almost kind of like we got stuff that it's like I know a lot of people like up in a certain area, like up north or something, for example. And I'll so I'll just kind of keep getting permission from people up north, and so I don't even bother with going down south. You know, he's got a lot of stuff down south, so he kind of he keeps broadening that ground down there. You know, we kind of work it that way too, and it works out good. Then we're not stepping on each other's toes and stuff too. You know, and we'll find and we'll find a new ground and uh, keep things going. When, when you guys first started hunting together, did you ever pull into a spot? Like, let's say, Chris, you had this spot and you pulled in there like, hey, I'm going to take you to this spot of mine, Eric. And then you pulled in there and Eric's like, oh, I've been here before. <laughs> oh, tell him about the one. Tell him about that one, Chris. We went into that set, you, me, and Jake. And I was like, yeah, I found this nice WPA and I heard some coyotes all when we were fishing offshore. And we walk in there and he's like, oh, shit, well, I'm going to go sit up by that rock pile because I've sat there before. And there's, I found a video camera up there. Some guys in it had film oh, uh, from back yeah. in the day. of, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I did. I, and, I never did, and I never even did find the guys who, who had the camera. I couldn't even track them down. We, there was a spot, you know, he, that was actually our, that was our very first, uh, the very first time we coyote hunted together. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so you yeah. found a video, like a video, like still up on a tripod or was it like just set on the ground? Like. No, what, what had happened is there was uh, there was some old farm equipment. It's an old old abandoned farmyard. Uh, the house isn't even there anymore, and they just they got some random equipment laid up there, and some old equipment and a couple grain bins. And it's, there's some um, there's some uh, rush loose and stuff in there, and it's you know kind of almost like that last set that we made um, uh, when you hunted there. And yeah. it's just a, it's just a, you just look at it. Oh, there's that piece of equipment sitting up on top of the hill. It's just something to hide by, so you can actually go to it. It's a it's a it's a good spot. So I I go up there and I. And I go sit down by, I can't remember what it was. It was a, I don't know, just some little random piece of equipment, an old digger or something. But anyway, so I go up there and I, and I, and I go sit down to call and I, and, and I look over and I see this little black bag. Um, it looked like about, about the size of a, one of my earbuds again, about the size of a, um, like, like, like a small, like little fanny pack. And I'm like, well, what's this little bag sitting there? You know, it had been raining. It was wet. It wasn't the fall of the year. I was out duck hunting and I decided to just go make a set for coyotes and, and it had been raining like crazy, and so I go over there and and I pick this thing up, and I'm like, "What the heck is this?" And I open it, unzip it, and here's a a Sony, like a fifteen hundred dollar Sony camcorder, you know, in there. I mean, a nice camcorder for the day, you know. This was probably oh, over ten years ago now, or more. Um, and so I didn't even turn it on. I I threw it up on the heater in my, my truck as I hunted throughout the day, and I thought I'll dry this thing out. Didn't know how long it was there, if it was like from the year before or what, you know. I mean, and so then I. I get back to the cab and then it's been on the heater all day. So I thought I'll try and turn this thing on. So I turn it on and it, it powers up and, and, and I open up, well, here's these guys sitting there and they are calling coyotes. They killed a coyote. I had the one guy's name, this first name, he called the one guy by somebody. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out who these guys are. Nobody's ever, ever known these guys knows who they are or nothing. And, but yeah, here was their camcorder with one coyote hunt on it, but they, they must've set it down 
you know, when they're packing their stuff up or maybe when they shot a coyote or something, I don't know. And <laughs> forgot it. And there it was. It sat there for, I mean, you think you'd notice your, your, your camcorder was missing, but I mean, I don't know. It was kind of, it was kind of crazy. Just like that, their dreams of having a coyote hunting DVD went up in smoke. Yeah, they're gone. All, all gone. I, I've got their footage if they're ever looking for it. If, if you're listening, <laughs> I got your camera too. <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> That's wild, man. I, yeah. yeah, that's you're gonna hear that story very often. We find a yeah. <laughs> I walked into a stand once, found a mojo critter out there, and I'm like, it was one of the spots. Oh, I thought this, you know, only sp- I was the only one that hunted it, right? Yeah, uh, nobody's ever been here, right? Yeah, I walked out there. I'm walking out to set the call out, and there's a mojo critter <laughs> that they had left. I'm like, yeah, whoops, I guess somebody else thought this is a pretty good spot, too, you know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But no, but we, we've done that on a few spots, though, you know, I mean, there's a couple places, like I say, you know, stuff just, I I mean, obviously I've been, you know, he's been hunting out here for some years and I've been out here for quite a few years myself, too, even before I lived here. Uh, you know, I've been, I, I mean, I've been hunting in North Dakota for, you know, 35 years now. Um, so, I mean, I've been out there for quite a while and, and lived out there myself now for what, uh, going on about almost 15 years now. I've been living out there, so. Um, you know, so I've been hunting a lot of ground over the years and we'll occasionally do that, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go to a spot and they'll be like, oh, here. And I'm like, yeah, I hunted right over there on this hill one time or, you know, or, oh yeah, just over the hill right there. I've, I've made stands there before and I've, I've killed coyotes here. So yeah, our ground does cross paths quite a bit. And I'm thinking the whole time, I'm like, dude, I got a gold mine seeing five coyotes running across this pasture and they went into this cattail slough. We need to hit it. And I'm showing him on the map and he's like, oh, that's so-and-so's. I'm like, you you know where it's at. Let me guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hunted it. I actually I hunted that cattail sloop, called a double out of there once or something. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we never we never like if that happens, you know, we never I don't ever bring up like, well, I killed one here one time. I think we should do this. Or he's like, Well, I killed one here. It's like kind of like I'm gonna take the caller here and he already knows where he's going downwind. And as long as I know where he's at and I'm not shooting that way and he knows where I sit down. You know, he's plucked coyotes that have literally came right behind me before, you know, take it, trying to get to my wind. And luckily, you know, he's smart enough. I trust him. And, it, you know, it's always as cautious when bullets are flying. But if I'm a, if I'm down below a hill, I have faith, all the faith in the world that Chris is going to make the right judgment call or maybe that coyote's too close to me. He's not going to shoot. Perfect example was Wednesday before you guys came up. We were just driving around to find some extra stuff, you know, and I went yeah. up and made a set. And he sat right by the truck because where we drove in, we had to stash the truck behind a road or a rock pile. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to take the call and go 200 yards up and over the hill into the wind. And you're my downwind. Unfortunately, if anything comes from X, you know, angle over here, like you're going to have to kill it or you might not even see a coyote. That was the chance we were willing to take. Sure enough, I, you know, start doing my thing. And all of a sudden I hear a suppressor crack and I was like, okay, sweet. So then I, you know, when it finished out the stand and I actually seen three coyotes standing out on the ice. So I crawled out of there cause I was exposed to them, but I don't think they couldn't really hear the sound as I could see in my binos. They weren't paying me any mind. I think they're just dinking around on the ice. So I was going to crawl back up over the hill and come get them. And I come back to the truck. He's like, dude, this coyote, he's like another 15 feet or 15 yards. He was going to be like running you over. He's like, I had to kill him. I was like, cool. Good job. Like, heck yeah, man. He's like, well, then I had another one coming in and he pegged the truck right away the way that this one come. And, and I'm like, all right, well, let's get this coyote and maybe go put a sneak on these other ones. Just sneak down into the slough and go get them. Well, we, there's just no way to do that. I mean, the truck, you know, it was a well beyond a three quarter mile walk to get to them where they were. And it was like, okay, we'll just save them for when Jeff and them guys come up. But it was funny. Yeah. That coyote was sneaking in literally to take me out. And I had no idea what was going on the hill right behind me. And, you know, and that's happened in tournaments all the time. I, I hear the suppressor crack and you can just tell the angle it's coming that when I think about the shot after the fact, it's like, holy shit, that, that coyote must be somewhere right behind me. And sure enough, I walk up over the hill going back to the truck and there's a coyote laying right there. So it's like I hook up to him and go and we meet back at the truck. But yeah, it happens a lot. You know, when you send a guy downwind like that, and like I said, that's how we've always hunted. We've always broken down these sections, unfortunately. Sometimes we get lucky with two-mile by two-mile sections where we already know right away, like, if we get in deep enough, we can maybe make two sets and we're going to kill a coyote or multiple. But a lot of these sets, we have to split up so far apart to cover more 
because of where we have to stash the truck due to drifted over roads that you just get up and down, you know. So that's kind of how we've hunted together. And and like I said, that's maybe one thing I wish was on our side was time management when it came to running into stands, sitting down, getting down to business in a tournament, making something happen. If we can tell the coyote's not coming and he's out there a ways, we're going to either A, make a judgment call like, yes, we can use the train and sneak on this coyote. We do that a lot, and we'll sneak to three, four hundred, five hundred if if we can do it. And we'll shoot the coyote. I'll take off running, or he'll do it, and I'll just run back to the truck and maybe drive around the section and pick him up. But it'd be nice to be able to do those drop sets because I hunted a tournament two weeks ago out in Kildare, and that's how we we did it. it. It was fun because I got to hunt by myself. Like I love hunting with a partner and being in conjunction with each other with a downwind guy. But I didn't even know where my partner. Well, he was nowhere near me. He dropped me off. And he would t- he kind of knew this ground out in the Badlands, you real rugged crap. And he said, you know, go over X Hill, get the wind right, and just do your thing, you know. And it, it worked out in our favor. I mean, we killed eight coyotes, and unfortunately, I think we only seen eleven or twelve. So it wasn't, like, you know, we had massive amounts of numbers coming in, but it was cool to try that, you know. But like I said, in these tournaments, Chris and I hunt, it never works. It just can't work that way. You know, we can't drop set. There's just too much time walking into these sets with snowshoes on or or even if you're walking on the snow for 30 yards and then you fall in for the next 20, and then you're just like, this is far enough. I'm If I call a coyote, if there's one near me, I'm going to call him and kill him, you know, f- if, as far as I have to. You brought up a couple of good points. You know, downwind guys and drop stands, both of them are, are tactics that you can use to kill coyotes. So, you know, downwind stuff is, to me, it's something I've always – done you know early on i saw the advantage to that you know especially hunting some of this more open stuff and even some of the tighter stuff sometimes having a downwind guy it's just a matter of how far that downwind guy gets put right what i you know after talking to a lot of coyote hunters i think what a lot of guys have the issue with is they're like well i want to sit at the call i want to watch the coyote come run into the call right and everybody sits there right so they can see that same coyote and watch their buddy shoot it and that's cool but like you said, when you have a downwind guy that's two, three hundred yards ar- around covering a probably a low percentage spot, right? Honestly, you know, highest percentage is that the coyote's going to be somewhere where the call guy's going to shoot it. But is there a chance that the downwind guy could kill a coyote where I can't see? And if the answer to that is yes, then by all means, put a downwind guy there, you know, granted, he's not going to see the coyotes you shoot. You're not going to see the coyote, But at the end of the day especially from contest purposes, <laughs> that's all that matters, right? You don't have to see the coyotes that are getting shot as long as they're getting shot. No, Mm-mm. exactly. You know, in, in I'm speaking- downwind all the time. I, 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 love, I love going downwind, actually. You know, and, and these coyotes out here, they, you know, because, and I think maybe it's because it's big open country. I don't know. I mean, you, you still get the coyotes that come charging straight into the call, you know, a little angle win or something. But, boy, we just get so many coyotes that like to – like to circle and take that win. They like to they like to run that 200 yards downwind of the call, you know, and they kind of swing around coming in like that. And I, I, I kill a lot of coyotes on the downwind side when we, when we set up like that. I have, you like know, I've, I've gathered set. some info over the years that like, to me, sometimes the more open the country, the more the coyotes circle, like, cause they can see, right. Like it's like, right. and they just have a tendency to want to fade a little bit more. Cause it's like, they can look up there and they can see everything that's going on. It's like, okay, let's circle around and you know, what's the fastest way yeah. for a coyote to really figure out what's going on. Right. They yeah, use their nose. And they, and, and they can see so well too. You know, I mean, it, it amazes me how, how much they can see it. Well, for example, we had actually, after you left, we went and made a, made some sets uh, that, that next morning. And uh, the very first set was a spot that I really wanted to get us into because it was such a good looking spot. I've hunted that, that ranch several times before but not from this very particular spot and i just really liked the, the looks of it well this coyote you know we talked about this earlier when we were, we were sitting around but they heard it was one of those coyotes that comes out and starts barking at you well she was she came to uh, I, I think i ranged it at like 1465 yards <laughs> oh, chip shot the closest yeah, oh, yeah absolutely I mean, you know another, <laughs> another 30 yards it was going down you know yeah. but anyway. <laughs> But, I don't even think my turret but, goes that high. Yeah, yeah, but she had she had come out at, to the top of the hill and 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 she kept barking at me, um, you, you know, pretty regularly like that. But and and from that far away, you know, and, and, and you can barely see her with uh, with your naked eyes. You know, I mean, she just because we see her in the binoculars pretty well. But 
and so finally I, I, I gave up obviously she wasn't coming in and but when but as soon as I was done I sat there for a minute or so and, and she just kind of sat on the hill and as soon as, as soon as I stood up I mean in white camel in the snow uh up against a rock pile as soon as I stood up she turned around and and, and tucked tail and ran I mean saw me like standing up from that far away it's just amazing how good their eyesight can be to do well you know I talk about this a lot you know a, a huge tactical error that a lot of coyote hunters make and and not every stand can set up this way but some stands you have the option to say okay i can sit here and i can see forever or i can sit here and i can't see very far i'm essentially calling the same place right 99 percent of coyote hunters are probably going to do what sit up high they're going to sit up higher where they can see right well the problem with that is is you're letting the coyote see right and we all know that every coyote doesn't come running in, right? Like a lot of them sit out there. I think a lot of times we, we talk about it, right? We talked about it a lot up there when we were hunting, you know, a coyote checks up and pops up on the little hill out there at four five, 600 yards and just sits there, you know, and, and is looking, well, obviously you can see it. So it can see where you're at and you call and you change calls and you throw everything at it and it just turns around and walks off or, or doesn't do anything. Right. Could it just be for whatever reason that coyote's like, I'm just good. I can see everything, right? That you didn't, you weren't able to trigger maybe a little curiosity in that coyote or something like that. But now you take that same setup and you put some sort of visible barrier between you and that coyote, right? Whether that's another little hill, a tree line, brush, whatever it may be. Now that coyote can't sit out there at 600 yards. Will they still? Potentially. But you have that upper chance now, that that little bit better chance that, oh, that coyote would be like, damn, this has got me thinking a little bit, or however the, the process that a coyote uses, right? And he's like, damn, I want to really know what's mm -hmm. going on over here. And guess what? Then they have to come, you know, to that, that top of that hill or wherever it is. And now you brought them in range. And now, like I said, every stand, you can't set it up that way. And will coyotes come running? You'll see them from 600 yards. Oh, yeah. But you know, if you're struggling and you're like, damn, these coyotes just keep sitting out there at four or five, 600 yards and just look at me and bark and do all kinds of stuff, then maybe it's time we say, okay, let's, let's make a tactical change in how we're making these setups. Let's purposely limit our visibility. And who knows, you might see uh, a little bit of something, you know, similar to that very last stand we made on the last day, you know, knowing how hard those coyotes came and you guys will see this on the last stand. I almost wish we would have been over the next hill, but we elected to check up a little short. So we were sitting on a bowl, right? And all of a sudden those, that pair of coyotes, it was so dark, they come flying up, but they got right to that lip about a hundred yards across and checked up and looked and we killed them. I mean, we would have killed them either way, probably that particular ones, but just because they were running hard to the call, but that's the kind of setups that sometimes I think, uh, you know, can work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Him and I will talk about that too. When we get to a set and he already knows he's like, all right, well, I'm going to go downwind and it's like okay well this stand's going to present itself a chance for me I'm a deer. you're not going to see me but i'm going down into a valley and i'm going to go down into the bottom so if anything does come up you can just crack at it if it's going downwind i'm not going to see it but yeah it's same thing i always try and disappear from the downwind guy you know any chance i get if the terrain presents itself that's the tricky part you know but if i can walk another hundred yards i'm going to walk another hundred yards just to get down below and get that call down and make sure that I'm concealed. You know, I like to lay on my belly all the time. I love to lay prone, but you know, as of late, I've been sitting up more, you know, because if I go down in those spots, it's tough to lay prone. And when you're that close to the call, you know, within a hundred yards, it's good to be able to sit down if you're the one running the call, you know, for coyotes, you get multiple coyotes coming in one stand. It's like, if I can get one shot, stop one, get another shot, and then shoot the one before it crests that last hill, I'm hoping that I can either hit it or my partner is going to cover that thing and shoot him on the way out of Dodge. So. so let me ask you this. I don't ever sit in the prone, but d when you lay in the prone, is it from a purpose of your shooting is better out of the prone or is it from the purpose that you think you're hidden better out of the prone? Uh, I would for say me, shooting. For me, it's both. Definitely shooting. Both. Yeah, and, and I'm going to take the chance just to uh, just to clarify, like because the very first one you're going to see of me on camera was missing a coyote. And <laughs> oh, he's already he's already he's been thinking about this uh, one for know, a while. Yeah, right. I'm work, I'm working on it here, right? It, so, it, it's so, been eating away at him. Yeah, it, yeah, it's been killing me, you know. But because you know, coyotes at 250 yards, I mean, are, are dead coyotes, you know, at least should be most all the time. Um, but I, 
I do. I don't shoot as well off of sticks. I, I actually miss a lot more coyotes shooting off of sticks just because of the fact that um, I'm not as steady if I'm on a, a set of sticks or bipods or something, you know, I mean, I, I love getting laying down on my short pods of prone like that. And, you know, you just got that three point rest and you're just, you just rock steady. You know, they're just like, I noticed on that, on that particular coyote, that was like, I think I range at 265 and, and I could tell in my crosshairs, I'd watch it. You know, it's facing me chest on, which you don't have a big target when they're facing me chest on. Anyway, you got what, five, six inches wide. And when you take all that fur off, there ain't much there, but I, I could see that crosshair is literally like bumping, you know, I, as, you know, just in my breathing or whatever it was, you know, I mean, I, it was wiggling just off of them just enough, you know, and then trying to get steady on them. And when I lay prone, that just doesn't happen. That was like just that. the I mean, pressure of the camera over your shoulder, Chris. I think 100%. That, that probably wasn't it too. I that had a little bit to do with it, maybe. But. Welcome, welcome to the big leagues. That's right, yeah, baby. Yeah. You got to be able to handle yeah, that. You, go. you know. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You know, so to me, to me, that's a tactical decision as well, too, because anybody that I've ever known that that prefers the prone, and maybe I'm wrong, but talking to these guys, they usually lay up on the top of a hill, right? Like, so you are trying to get high vantage. But obviously, if you sit at the top of a high hill, you've realized, okay, I can't do that because I'm silhouetted. But laying prone, obviously, you don't have as much of a silhouette that the coyotes are going to pick out. As Would you agree to that? I mean, it's harder to lay in the prone when you're halfway down on the side hill, right? Like, that's almost right. impossible yeah. when your legs right. are and, higher and, than and your I head. Think, yeah, and those two go hand in hand, too, even shooting. Like, if you're laying down prone, obviously, like, if you're on a, on a little bit of a downhill, I mean, then you can't shoot, like, upwards because yeah. you don't have that. You know, so you, you need to be on top of that hill, you know, and, and I don't know, I guess I just think of like Mark Wahlberg and Shooter, you know, I mean, right? you got to be laying off <laughs> way up there where nobody can see it. <laughs> but, yeah. and we yeah, take a lot of long shots, too. I mean, we, you know, if a coyote checks up at a hill and it's just not coming, you're just throwing the book at him and he's just sitting up there, just sits down. We'll, we'll crawl, we've crawled right over. He's, he's microphone, you know, on the walkie talkie, like, hey, I got to. I got a coyote here that he's at like five and some change or 600 yards or 350, whatever it is. He's not coming. Like, let's one, two this thing. And I've crawled, I crawled over with my snowshoes on and we lay down. And, you know, it's just one of them things like I always grew up hunting deer, you know, in a stand in Minnesota. And I always had to hunt off the rail of like my flip down on my stand. And then when I cut my teeth on just doing it on foot, then it was like, okay, if I can look down, I'm going to lay down because hey, I'm rock steady. And I'm probably going to drill this deer or drill this coyote, you know, if I got a good win and I can get that win right. But I don't know. I'd say, honestly, God, maybe them first stands with you last year in South Dakota, I was sitting down and I was like, okay, I can, I can do this. This is, you know, I can, I can figure out a way to make this another part, you know, because, you know, not, not every stand presents itself that you can lay down. So it's like, yeah, you got to bring your sticks with, or, you know, swaggers on your gun, which I don't have. I used to run them, but they're just heavy, bulky for me. You know, but I definitely am sitting down more and I'm killing more coyotes because I noticed a lot of times when I would lay on my belly on a little bald hill or next to one lone rock and I'd have that call down there and I had coyotes that come from the upwind side or the downwind side couldn't win me. It's like I get two or three coyotes coming in and it's like I'd have to shoot the first one on the run because I can't get them to stop. Just on. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and one goes this way, one goes that way. So then you're, cr you know, you're rolling on your belly and then you got to yep. get fixed and, and just notice the more multiple coyotes I've been able to kill are sitting up, you know, when they check up after you shoot one and you get dressed, well, that's a given, but it doesn't always happen like that. So, you know, practice, I practice it a lot now sitting on my ass, you know, and just shooting my target in the backyard or out in North Dakota with Chris. Like when I shoot my thermal, I always sit down. When I'm sighting it in, I don't do it on my uh, tripod just because I, I can, you know, rest my back up against the tire of the truck and shoot sitting down. But, yeah. You know, that is a that – it's it's back to tactics too, you know. Um, I've seen that with guys like, you know, guys that are want to usually lay up higher on the hill. They're used to shooting coyotes at 200 yards, right? But they're shooting up the prone, so it's good. So, and sometimes I think to myself, you know – are they shoot them at, shooting them at 200 yards because just their style of calling, they're up on top of the hill, laying, even though they're laying in their prone, the coyotes are still spotting them, so, but they don't know what they are. So the coyotes are all checking up at like 150, 200 yards and looking at them. And then that's when guys are whacking them because they're in the prone, they're ready to go, right? 
does that go hand in hand, right? Like if you're going to lay on the, are you going to get coyotes to check up out there because they are seeing you? On purpose. On yeah. pur- It's almost like a almost purpose. Like that's just your style. I'm going to lay up here on the hill in the prone. If the coyote sees me and checks up at 200 yards, who gives a crap? I'm going to blast because I'm, I'm in yep. a prone, right? Yep. You know, where the style that I've always hunted, especially over the last 10 or 12 years, having all these new guys hunting with me, a 200 yard shot is, is not where I want people to be shooting at coyotes because the averages go way down. So I'm like, okay, yeah. how can we set up to where we can get these coyotes as close as possible? Because obviously, you know, percentages are going to go way up if we're making 100, 100 yard, 75 yard broadside shots all day long, you know? So it's oh, just, yeah. yeah, it's a, yep. it's just a little bit difference in, in, uh, you know, your style, I guess, is probably the best way to put that. Not that it's right or wrong. It's just, uh, you know, those styles kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. I think now uh, I'm hunting with Chris. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I thought you were just calling us horrible callers that we couldn't get them any closer than 200 yards. <laughs> Well, I like shooting them sprinting at the call, right? I like getting them running right, right at the call. Right, that's why I sit in the right, sitting right. so I can swing and shoot them running right at the call. You know, that's that's what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> Definitely strategy, though. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, you, and, and I, I carry both. I carry my, my longer sticks for sitting, and, and, and I carry them in every stand, and I make that decision when I get there. I mean, there's some places that I know that I've hunted over years, but even now, like this year, there might be some places that I've laid down prone because I would, you know, and you talked about this about, about a snow drift, you know, that great spot you said, because the fence, you know, the snow was up over the fence and you could stand on the snow drift and shoot. Yep. And then you go there and there's no snow and all of a sudden, Oh, I can't stand up. You know, I stand up here. I can't see nothing when I'm, when I'm four feet lower because I'm not on the snow. Yep. Um, and so that, that, that plays like right now, you know, like when you hunted with us there, you know, we didn't have much snow. And so obviously your grass was tall, you know, you're not going to lay down nowhere. You're going to see nothing um, unless you're laying on top of a rock or something. Uh, so obviously you got to, you got to sit. Um, and so that's, that's just something I just kind of adapt and I, um, I actually am more comfortable to sit, um, than I am to lay prone. You know, obviously, as I told you earlier, I'm getting older, uh, I already disclosed kind of my age and, <laughs> but, uh, but I, and so obviously as it's harder for me to lay down prone, my neck, you know, after a while, I'm like, oh man, my neck's killing me, you know, from trying to lay there and look up and spot stuff, you know, it's, it's definitely harder that way. So it's a lot more comfortable to sit and, you know, and if I got decent cover, um, I, I like to sit up and, and be, be, I, I can see around, I can turn my head and look behind me a lot easier and that kind of stuff. But, um, but like I say, if I, if I have the chance to lay down, I just feel like I'm steadier and I, and I, and I feel like I, I hide a little better if I'm laying down flat. It just depends on the situation. Yeah. See, you really yeah. could have made Ricky not like us any more than he does already for dragging around coyote hunting by making him lay in pr- prone beside you with the camera. <laughs> you know, when you're running the downwind, you could say, Ricky, you need to lay in the prone. He'd have looked at you like you're crazy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll get him in on a little more of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. The other yeah, the other piece of this we talked about was drop stands. You know, and I don't know if I've ever really talked about these on, on a podcast, maybe potentially when we were talking about contest tactics and stuff like that. You know, and, it, and it's a tactic for killing coyotes, you know. Some contests they're illegal. You can't, they're part of the rules. You cannot do yeah. drop stands. Meaning both both teammates have to stay together the entire hunt. You have to hunt together. You have to be in on the same stand. So obviously the tournaments you're hunting in, the rules will be different. So you'll have to watch that. But if they do allow it, I mean it's a huge tactical advantage because you know now you're essentially making two stands for the price of one. You know by you know essentially let's say if I'm hunting with Eric. I would drop him off right here and he would walk in and make the stand. I would go up the road to the next spot where that's a mile, half mile, whatever it may be. And then I run in and I make a stand. So you're essentially making two stands at the same time. Uh, another way to do that would be, let's say there's nowhere to park a truck. Maybe it's flat, you know, nowhere to hide. You're like, dang, this is a good spot. Maybe you saw a coyote back behind on a place you had to, and you could, a guy kind of just rolls out the side of the truck on the go and he jumps the fence, runs out in the pasture. And you just keep driving with the truck and he goes and calls and kills the coyote, you know? So that's really what we're talking about when it comes to drop stands. Um, you're probably not something that you'll do if you're just fun hunting with your buddies, because that's the part of it, right? You want to be together and you want to hunt fun. Yeah. From a contest point, if you're talking about how efficient can we be, how many coyotes can we kill in a certain amount of time? That's really what we're talking about when it comes to drop stands. Even even particular spots. Yeah. I mean, I've had a couple spots that I've been into that it's like you know when it, 
out in this country, it's just big, wide open flat, but yet, like, maybe there's some cattail sloughs out there or something that you just know that have some coyotes in them, but, you know, every time you try and call it, you know, a coyote comes out, he sees your pickup because you just can't hide it anywhere, um, you know, and so, so maybe you want to hunt that spot, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll take and I'll, I'll have my wife drop me off and say, hey, I'll, I'll call you in 15, 20 minutes when I'm done, you know, or she'll drop me off and I'll jump out the truck and bail on you. Go make a set, you know, because it's, <laughs> dude, that's know, the I mean, perfect that, thing. Just get somebody that doesn't even like to coyote hunt to drive you around and just drop you off on stands all day. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> then go, go, go around, coyote, coyote go around Uber. the side of the section. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Bring your book, yeah, honey. Yeah. I'll call you when I'm, yeah. when I'm walking back. Yeah. yeah. Uber for coyotes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that tournament a couple of weeks ago, that was the first tournament I've ever, ever done that in. Because, like, the ones that I used to hunt in South Dakota, the big ones like the Troy Anderson, the Randy Rohde, couldn't do that. You had to be within, I mean, they say earshot, but I think they put a number like you couldn't be more than 200 yards or whatever it was from your partner. Yeah, you got to be on so the same stand, like, when, making the same stand yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see why guys kill, put up numbers that they do 100%. You know, there's reason guys put up 14, 15, 20 coyotes in a day when they can do that if the ground allows it and they already have their spots mapped out. But it just goes back to we just don't have that possibility. And, yeah, we can go find new ground where that could probably work. But we've kind of figured out a pattern in these tournaments where we have the second place curse. Chris will tell you. It's just like, well, let's – yeah, I'll do the tournament, but you already know what's going to happen. We're going to tie with the same amount of coyotes as the winner, and we're going to lose in weight. And we're going to take second place, walk away a thousand bucks or whatever, you know, but we always joke about that. Like Chris's wall behind him, not there, but at his house, when he'll call me or FaceTime me, it's like, I can just see second place, second place, second place, second place. place. (laughs) They do call that the first loser. First place loser, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's that's our curse. Uh, Could be worse. worse. Let's, Let's finish this podcast out. Let's talk about our hunt a little bit, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of give everybody a little behind the scenes thing. You know, when, when I'm looking at planning these last stand hunts, you know, I actually met Eric last winter. Um, he mentioned Terry a few times. I had done a coyote school up at, at the lodge that they're talking about. And, and Eric and Terry and a few other guys joined the class and had a, had a hell of a fun time, killed a lot of coyotes. And just through windshield time and just getting to know these guys, you know, they started talking about hunting up in North Dakota. Well, you know, out of all the states I've had a chance to hunt, North Dakota was not one of them. So it was on my list to hunt. So you know, we talked over the summer and kind of started getting things going. And, and then once, you know, the the summer ends and my baseball stuff ends and I start thinking about coyote hunting stuff, I start putting together these filming schedules and things like that. So I thought, you know what? Uh, and, and of course, Lucky Duck always wants us to try to go to new spots, right? Like, we, I mean, I could hunt in the sand hills all the time and kill plenty of coyotes on camera and some of the other places we always go. But me personally, I love going to new spots. Um, but yeah. it's just part of the deal when you're filming a show like that, you want to see new terrain. I, I love to show new people and new places and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, we put together this plan and, uh, Eric was like, yeah, you know, Chris and I, between what we got, this will be a fun hunt. And I said, awesome. You know? So what I think a lot of people don't realize is I think very few people have ever hunted coyotes for three straight days, you know, right. like, I don't know if you guys have ever hunted before this hunt, have ever hunted coyotes for three straight full days, you know, I come out on Friday and scout hunt the Saturday tournament and I go home Sunday. You know, I don't think people understand the amount of logistics, the amount of effort that goes into lining up that much ground to, to hunt for three days straight. It's a huge undertaking, you know, and that's what you guys did for this thing. You know, I don't, you know, that's basically what I say is, Hey guys, you think we can do it? And, that was all on you guys, man. Right. Like, let's say, Hey, I think we can do this. And you know, you guys put in the massive amount of work and effort it took to, to line all that stuff up. Mm-hmm. And, the other, and, and weather too, you know, of course, as you'll, you'll see, I mean, obviously we, we had some, the, the, the fun North Dakota. <laughs> Welcome to North you, Dakota. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> that nobody wants to have, but you know, I, and I tell you all, the, even, even, you know, my family, my brothers all come out, they come out, they come out and fish and do this and that. And they say, oh yeah, we're going to come out for a long weekend, you know, and that, oh yeah, we'll get four days of fishing in. And I'm like, okay, so what's really going to happen, you're going to come out for a long weekend and you're going to get one, one good day of fishing in and you're really going to fight with the wind and the weather and the battle that comes with North Dakota the rest of the days because... That's typically what happens. I mean, it's it's tough to put together three or four days in a row when you don't have high winds. I mean, it happens, yep. yeah. But uh, you know, obviously, like like the three days after you left would have been perfect. But oh yeah, like it usually is, <laughs> of course. But 
but you know, I mean, and so that's a struggle too. You know, just just try. You, we can't plan the weather. I mean, yeah. The well, when we so. when we put this stuff together in August, you know, you know, I'm I'm not only coordinating with myself and, and my schedule with everything. You know, I was coordinating with Rick. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it on this trip. But then I'm coordinating with camera guys that live on the East Coast, so they're buying plane tickets. You know, I'm coordinating. You know, we're coordinating with you guys. And then we're trying to coordinate around big game seasons and other things like that and try to find the the best three-day period. But we're making these, you know, we're locking these three days in three months before we're going to be hunting. So it's like, you know, it is what it is, right? When we head up there at that point, nothing mm-hmm. we can do about it except grind them out, do what we can. And, you know. Two total opposite ends of the spectrum. We got sun, I got sunburnt. I remember I got sunburnt on Thursday. And all of a sudden, I think I was chapped windburnt by Saturday night when we were at the restaurant eating steak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yes, the first day it's 55 degrees, wind blew. I may have got up 12, 15 mile an hour. Not bad, but you're right. Sunny, kind of a bluebird day for first part of December for North Dakota, right? You know, Absolutely. and then the very Literally, next yeah. very next morning, it's kind of overcast, gloomy, winds blowing a little bit. And by about 11 o'clock, it starts spitting these big, heavy, wet snowflakes. And it's just in a matter of an hour, everything's covered in white. We can't even run the cameras because it's just caked on everything. You know, wind's blowing. You know, we called it quits about 1 o'clock on the second day. It just We could have probably grounded out and, and, and hunted, but, you know, the camera guys are, are walking around with thousands of dollars worth of gear, and they weren't real impressed that we were out there. So... <laughs> <laughs> so i said all right let's let's pull the plug you know and then the and then the third day you know we got four or five inches of fresh snow it's you know what mid to high 20s i think but we had about a 30 right from the get-go at sun up the wind was blowing 30 already you know and it stayed pretty consistent 30 all day blowing snow and it maybe you know we didn't see a little bit of break in the weather or the wind till like the last two stands of the day you know but yeah, you just never know, mm-hmm. man. It's it, it's it's wild. Yep, they roll the dice with the weather. Oh, yeah, that's what something God, with, I you remember know, sitting wind on and... one of them stands. Oh yeah, go ahead, Eric. I just remember sitting on one of them stands. Of course, I went upwind a little bit. You were on one side of the tree grove, I you know, and and uh, Cam was right next to you, and then I'm on the other side, and I had stepped down into about three feet of snow, got my seat settled, and I'm sitting there and. You were like, we're gonna make this an eight eight minute stand. Like it's gonna yeah, it's gonna happen that. or it's not. <laughs> and I go to get up and I got snow drift coming over my knees. My holes where I stepped in are already filled up with snow. It's just like, yeah. oh good lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just I'm just warning everybody when this when this episode's come out, you're gonna see some of the most awesome B roll that you've probably ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of us busting yeah. through drifts, pulling trucks out of drifts, snow blowing across the <laughs> landscape. You know, us walking in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, you know, talking about the yeah. wind and, you know, strategy for hunting in the wind. But, uh, yeah, wasn't a whole lot of action that day for coyotes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's one of those things, too, you know, that's – and I've always felt my – found myself fairly privileged because of that. You know, I've been – over the years, whether it started with contests – Um, And then progressing into doing like guided hunts and coyote schools and things like that. I've been forced to hunt a lot in days that aren't great. Right. Most coyote hunters are looking at the thing and like, Hey, hey, Eric, you want to go out hunting on Saturday? Wind's going to be 10, you know? Okay, great. And then Friday night rolls in and all of a sudden they change the forecast to 25 monitor when you're like, nah, nah, let's, let's, let's save that (laughs) until it's the the perfect weather. Right. (laughs) I think that's the way most guys coyote hunt, you know, absolutely. but to me, you don't learn anything, right? Like, are coyotes still killable in those situations? Of course they are. You know, we didn't quite show that, but, uh, you know, coyotes don't go anywhere when the wind's blowing 30 or 40. They're still there. Are they locked way down? Yeah. Are they going to come running from a mile? Probably not. Um, you know, but like we talked about, we could have sat in the lodge and drank beer all day, but, you know, we you, yeah. you can't kill them in the lodge. That's the probably the only guarantee there, right? Like, Yeah, for sure. Exactly. And yeah. and it, if we'd have done that, nobody would have got to see my Toyota pull out the Chevy from the snowdrift. <laughs> you know? Well, unfortunately, the cameras didn't show me this all day long. Yeah. That <laughs> uh, yep, that's, yeah, they tur- yeah. Hey, 
hey, they are my cameramen. I got to remember remind you of that. I, I know, you know, I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't find one. I remember, state, you know, <laughs> I remember sitting in the truck when we approached that snowdrift, and I looked at him, and I'm like, "Let me get out and just go walk and see how deep this actually is." And I remember getting on the other side, and I was like, "Don't do it." Don't do it. And all of a sudden I hear that engine just go boom. And all of a sudden it's just like wham. Uh, yeah. No, it was great, man. You know, the first day we, we killed six coyotes that first day. You'll see that on the first episode when it comes out. You know, that to me, the most probably the my the the most fun stand was the stand where I killed my first North Dakota coyote, and then Chris rolled the one on the back door out across the ice. You know, we were sitting on the opposite sides of the tree row and this coyote just comes flying up out of the tree row on my side. And luckily, I being a left-handed shooter, I was on the right. Eric was kind of off to the left and kind of busted out, saw the call, kind of spooked a little bit, but checked up and I shot it. Well, we had the second coyote coming in and, you know, we can't see this coyote. And uh, Chris is over there with the second camera and he ends up rolling it out on the ice, you know. Um, but we got yeah. to test how thick the ice really was. Luckily, it was thick yeah. enough. <laughs> that would have been a first chris if you'd have fallen through the ice going to get a coyote that would have made a last stand first you know yeah well and, <laughs> I, I remember. And, I, and i figured at least if i would have fell into my death you could have recorded it for me and you know, everybody would have known he that even said that he said that to the camera guys he was like you guys need to be filming this because if he goes in i want to get that on film <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hell yeah, with chris i just want this on camera yeah that's right <laughs> Please fall through the ice. Please yeah. fall through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was yeah. fun, yeah. Um, no, it was it was a fun hunt, man. I you know, I I you know, I had an awesome time. You know, I know you guys are probably too. on the disappoint. I mean, if I was in your shoes after all the anticipation, right? Like anticipation were coming up, you save all this ground, you you know, you have this three day hunt and then the weather just screws us. It's kind of like, God dang it, you know, it's just it sucks, you know, mm -hmm. but, but I'll tell you guys, I had an, I had an awesome time. So don't, uh, don't feel bad. Like I said, I've been on uh, way worse adventures than, than right. and it was, and that weather had nothing to do with, trust me. So, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. No, I, I had a great time too. And it, you know, and, and the pressure is, you, you feel that, you know, I mean, oh, like, it's pressure, like, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you like the, it was the second day. I remember the second day specifically we walked in and I'm, you know, I'm trying to put together a plan of where we're going to go on, you know, for, for the wind we had and what we're going to do. And I remember getting out of the truck and I'm like, and I told you guys, now you guys just walk up to that haystack up on the hill. Oh, yeah. And I, and you, and, I, and you looked at me and you're like, that, that haystack? And Eric's like, must yeah. walk up there. And he, like, Jeff pulls, like, out his, Jeff pulls out his binos and he ranged it. And he's like, yeah. that's like 350 more. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me tell you something, Chris, where I come from, we just drive right up there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I just remember seeing a look at you guys. I'm like, it's really not that far. You know, and I'm just, I'm used to walking like that out here a lot for coyotes. Can we do a lot? No, yeah, we probably could have drove almost to the bottom of that hill and you guys could have probably just walked like 60 yards up and there probably been the same thing. But I, I just I, I remember that and I, and I was sitting down and then, of course you know I went down with Ricky and we're sitting down there and you know and, and I don't know that he's got me on film with that but because he was probably just filming you know the surroundings at the time but but when I I obviously I didn't see the coyotes that were coming in but all of a sudden I just I just heard the, I just heard the guns go off and I heard a couple shots and I just like had this gigantic <laughs> sigh and I was like oh like I was like Phew. You know, I just like like the pressure, like a weight just lifted off your shoulders, because I was like, oh man, if, if we don't see any coyotes or kill any coyotes, I mean, it's like my street cred just went right out the yeah, window, right? Yeah. There, you, know? <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because it did. I just, I just like felt like this giant weight just lifted off my chest when you guys shot, you know, because you, you little know, you little do you, a little yeah. bit, you know. <laughs> little do you know, we never even went to that haystack, Jeff. Like this is far enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, we can't see shit from the haystack. We're going yeah, over we're here. Sitting over here. This is good <laughs> no, it, it is. I, you know, I, I joke with guys when we, when we're going when we go hunt new place with guys. I joke with them about that pressure because it's easy, right? Like you start thinking about all that's you know. I'm sure in your mind, you're like rolling through those those stands we had made that you had made in previous years and all the coyotes you'd killed on those stands and you're just like oh my god why how, where why are there no coyotes man I, you're right. just thinking about all that right and it's like you're like damn you know but it it happens to all of us i had the yeah, same thing no, happens yeah. to me 
Oh yeah. <laughs> well, even when you go out, just just hunting, hunting for fun, you know. I mean, how many times you go out to a spot that you've you've killed coyotes? How many times you go out to that spot and just that particular day, it just doesn't happen for you, you know. I mean, for whatever reason, the, you know, the coyotes are a little farther away. They, the weather was, you know, for whatever reason, they don't. It it just doesn't happen. Happen and you know, unfortunately, that's the way the way it works sometimes. Yep. But, yep. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't burn any hunter percenters on that trip, did we? We did not. Just, just one. Okay, just perfect. One. I, I always feel bad. One. Just one, one, the last one. You're like, the save the best, very best stand you have, Eric. And I was like, this, I'm going to go ahead yeah. and say it. This is we, 100% spot. Yep. That, that was yeah. a tactical decision. We were looking at the weather and we're like, all right, yeah. the wind's going to die right at dark. We're going to have like one stand to make this happen. Yep. And I, Eric, I said, game plan. And I said, wherever you think it's going to be the best, that's where we need to be in that last stand. And oh, it was a badass stand. I, I oh, can yeah, see yeah, why yeah. you guys have killed lots of coyotes there. You know, and, and typically when we when we call that, now the wind was different, you know, for today than a lot of days. A lot of days when we call that, if we got a little different wind, we got like a, you know, like a, like either a west or northwest wind. Um, we'll call that almost straight up from where we park the trucks. We'll get up on top of that hill up there. At least I do. Eric will go down kind of closer toward where you guys sat. And then I usually sit on that hill down on the, on the end down there and, you know, just – it just every, every time, time. Like, the coyote every circle, time. The coyote around and I went and shoot the coyote off of that hill on the back side or, or, or you know, on here, or he'll shoot one over there and I'll shoot one on the other side, you know, just, but yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. this, this was the day, you know, it happens. Yeah. If I've learned anything over the last few years, the best way to burn a hundred percent is bring the cameras, you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and tell her and tell everybody on, on film. That oh, it's her to, yeah. And talk about it. Oh, this is a hundred percenter guys. This is going to be great. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And then of course our other hundred percent spot, the cameras weren't there when I when we went into that uh, waterfall production area. Yep. The cameras weren't there. And I told Mark and I to the same Chris, I'm like, I gotta sit back here and watch that corner. It's just notorious. They come from this corner all the time. And sure enough, I'm sitting down there and one just pokes his head up over the hill and it's like, Well, if he keeps coming, he's gonna catch the calls wind. So it's like, okay, shoot. And then all of a sudden I hear, you'll see in the video, I hear Jeff Swaggers going back into his gun. They're done. Call was shut off. And I look back and 20 feet away, here comes a, a little head poke up over the hill. And it's just like, oh, great. There's no cameraman there too. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, that was my bad. I, you know, we had about three areas kind of should have come is. from. I should have, you know, I, that's the one stand I was thinking about the other day. And I was like, you know, I should have just asked you a little more. I should have got a little more intel on the stand from you because, after we after the fact and we started talking about that's where you guys normally see the coyotes when you're down in there we should have i, I would have put one camera right there for sure you know and probably not even put the camera way downwind with chris we'd have brought both cameras to that point you know that rock pile mm-hmm. we were sitting on and we could have had coverage on both sides you know but yeah hindsight's 2020 yeah, i guess you know yep, can't get them all on camera we do our best but no. you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and in that case too like in that uh, on that stand i mean that last stand of the day i mean we were like we were actually going to go a little further down but we were running out of time and we running out of daylight you know and so you just kind of we kind of rushed in and like just like yeah let's just do it you know made a made, made a last minute set and then you know sometimes that's that's what's got to work for you yep yep well my last question for you chris are you going to tell me what your little secret was seasoning on those uh those steaks at the cafe Good luck. absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. it's a it's hundred percent love Hundred percent love. <laughs> I've tried. Jeff. I've tried. I've really no, he, he, he I've even budget. tried to. I've even tried to watch him, and he's like, "Why don't you go help I do dishes yeah. while I cook these steaks?" It's like, "Oh, you, you would." Well, I'm but telling you, if you're listening, if if, if you're listening, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're listening to this, and you're ever up in Pettybone, North Dakota, or close to it, swing over to the Harvesters Cafe, Chris. What nights do you guys serve steaks? Is it only on certain nights? Steaks are, steaks, steaks are Saturday nights. Yep, Saturday nights. Saturday night yeah, steaks. Facebook. All right. So yeah. go on I in there and get yourself the ribeye. I don't know. the. Fl- it was a toss-up. but We had a filet yeah. one night with the ribeye the other night. I don't know, man. I don't know. Was, They're both good. <laughs> One's a little bigger than the other, though, you know? Heck, heck yeah. <laughs> I, asked, I asked for medium, and he gave me uh, a rare, and it's like, I'm not going to even argue. Just eat it. <laughs> Just eat it. Just yeah. So good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, fellas, it's been fun. Yeah. 
What yes, uh, you, I know you guys you guys do social media a little bit, right? If somebody wanted to follow along your your exploits, I'm sure you guys post some stuff on on coyote hunting here and there and things like that. What uh, what's your tag handles on on that kind of stuff? Chris is a big Snapchat guy. <laughs> yeah. you can see it from from the 27 times i put my earbuds back in my ears how, how technical of a person i really am here uh you know but no i i, I do get on facebook um uh a little, a little bit I, I don't post a lot eric you probably post more stuff like videos and stuff eric, eric puts a lot of stuff on. Need to, hey that you want to talk coyote hunting you just swing into the cafe chris will, chris would love to he'll talk coyotes with you all day he'll talk oh, him, but he's not taking you out so don't yeah ask. yeah no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> no, i got an instagram i got an instagram but i don't do much with it i get it's just my name eric Instagram. scott so Scott's yeah i do a, my my boat business i put up a lot of boat business and just some recap pictures of weekends but i don't get into it too much you know i just it's tough you know you don't do it very often you know in the times i do it's like i always forget my phone in the truck so i can never capture things on stand so actually i'm, I'm oh, yeah. starting to film a little bit more now and gonna try and compile like a little kill kill video so instagram reels that's where it's at no I'm i know just joking. i know <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, my space <laughs> my space yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny. Uh, well fellas it's been fun man i really appreciate you guys lining up the hunt uh you know i had a hell of a good time hunting with you guys uh i'm gonna be back that's for sure just awesome country i you know that that do they consider that the prairie pothole region? Yeah, one hundred percent. The central North Dakota is that's the pothole region, and that's why you know we have all those rush sewers and so much water and stuff yeah, around yeah. the area. Um, that's you know really within probably a, a hundred square mile radius right there of where we are. That is the heart of the prairie pothole region right there. Yeah, um, it's just awesome. You'll see if, if you're watching the last stand episode. You know we got some drone footage and stuff like that where you'll see just. Just these little ponds and marshes and big lakes, too, just scattered all over, rolling hills in between, buck brush, ag, you name it. I mean, just a coyote paradise, man. I can see why, you know, the coyote numbers are what they are up there just because of that uh, that habitat. So yeah. pretty Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Yep. Heck yeah. Well, guys, I want to thank you for listening for another episode here of Eastman's Predator Pros. Like always, I appreciate your feedback um you know those five star reviews on spotify go a long ways um to be honest with you the sponsors don't listen to this podcast they don't know how cool it is and how awesome it is uh but they do take a quick peek at those reviews and that gives them a uh, insight on to on to how the uh, the podcast is going so i appreciate all that um if you're looking for more information about myself you can go to my website which is coyotecraze.com that'll get you links to my social media stuff um you know, eric's over there flashing the merch a little bit you know the coyote fear me hoodies. Um, you got to be on my Instagram page, which is at Jeff Nimnick to find those every now and then, you know, but, uh, but yeah, go over to my website, coyotecraze.com. That'll get you links to um, the last stand videos too. So got to, uh, you know, this North Dakota hunt, there'll be a couple episodes coming on that. And then we're going to finish up the season with some thermal stuff down at Rick. So, um, but like I mentioned with the sponsors, we can't do that without, without them. So need to thank them. Six hour optics, swagger bipods, Hornady, lucky duck, predator calls, silencer, central Cryptech juniper mountain coffee on x hunt and of course eastman's for putting this all together and bringing this to you guys i think there's still time tag hub uh if you're a big game guy looking for uh, application stuff out west uh their tag hub stuff's going big right now i don't do it so i i'm the worst guy to probably promote it and tell you about it but if you're into that stuff go over to eastman's.com and check out the <laughs> tag hub and uh you can find out everything they got going there but once again guys appreciate you listening and we'll catch you next time right here on the eastman's predator pros podcast <laughs>